Welcome back to the Ride Boundless Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Ride Clean. Uh, I haven't had many sponsors on here because I haven't looked for any, but I thought this should be the the product that we launched that we should talk about. And um, I actually got a Ride Clean promo script, and I'm just going to read the way it is. Uh, so here's how it starts. Um, car displayed in empty parking lot. It's day. Narrator is seen standing next to vehicle shined up with Ride Clean. Narrator, superior shine and protection for your car or motorcycle in any kind of weather. Ride Clean offers an ultra premium alternative all in one wash and wax waterless product. It's ideal for clients conscious of their vehicle's need for UV protection and the environmental risk of chemical exposure. Ride Clean offers a worry free cleaning and waterproofing solution to windows, polishing leather without residue and maintaining of paint jobs. And then it goes to bike and car display in empty parking lot. Day narrator stands between a motorcycle and car shined up with ride clean. Can you guys visual it, visualize it? And then the narrator says, wash, wax, polish and seal within minutes using ride cleans ultra premium formula. Ride easy, ride clean. And because it's the ride boundless podcast, ride boundless guys, I use this on everything. It really works. Outstanding. Um, I've taken it to expo shows, AIM Expo, SEMA. I sell out completely. Go to rideclean.co and use promo code RB podcast and you'll get 15% off. Uh, again, that's rideclean.co and use promo code RB podcast for 15%. You won't regret it. It's the best thing for motorcycles, and it's outstanding for cars. On this episode, we went to Riverside and checked out SoCal Supermoto. We talked to our boy Brian about what he teaches and what he does out there. He was really cool. Um, he's a very busy guy, and he took time to sit down with us, and we had a very cool conversation. So let's get that started, and here we go. <laughs> How are things in San Diego? And how long have you, have you been? Yeah, I, basically San Diego, I just moved to, you know, like uh, back in the day, my, you know, wife wanted to move to the East Coast and, you know, I wanted to move back to San Francisco and then San Diego was a compromise. So that's how I ended up in San, you know, San Diego. And that was 20 years ago and I didn't know anything about it. I, was I mean, like, but that, that, that's such a broad spectrum. East Coast, San Francisco, yeah, it was San like, Diego. I wanted what? to be in California and, you know, and basically didn't want to go back to San Francisco and just, it was completely random pick. I actually came back from the Peace Corps. I was in the Peace Corps in like Vanuatu and uh, just trying to figure out where we we're going to go and just picked. It was almost like the same as like throwing like a dart at the, you know what I mean? I knew yeah. I surf, so I needed to be near the coast and, um, San, yeah, Francisco, just, San Francisco's got good surfing too. Pacifica yeah, yeah, down totally. there south. Yeah. Yeah. That was all, I was all about it when I was there and then, um, just moved to San Diego and, you know, and I think, there's kind of that split NorCal, SoCal, you know, vibe where everybody in Northern California has like an attitude about the Southern California people and everybody in Southern California is like, I don't know, we're cool. Like, you yeah, know, like what's happening? <laughs> so I came down and yeah, I think it was, uh, I don't know, maybe a little NorCal attitude. And then I'm like, everybody here is kind of dumb and happy. And then I became dumb and happy. And, you know, now I don't want to happy. Now I'm happy. I don't want to go, I don't want to go anywhere. Happy. Yeah. I'm dumb and happy. And that's yeah, where I'm going to stay. And I, I love it. And it, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to, it's the standard cliche of like, you can do everything, but you can't do everything. I mean, we spend a, you know, with my kids, I'm always going snowboarding, surfing, skateboarding. How many kids do you have? Uh, two kids, I have 14 and 16. So great. Ages. Um, yeah, they're totally good. I can't get them out here. They're like, it's hot and I have to get up early. So <laughs> here, here we're in Riverside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here in Riverside. So um, yeah, they're spoiled. They get to kind of choose like the raddest stuff to do. But yeah, with the with the kids, like yesterday went skateboarding. You know, basically I was here the day before teaching school, and then uh, yesterday, you know, had the kids and just went uh, went skateboarding, ate some lunch, went surfing, and that's pretty much 
every day. You know, that's just what we do man, all the time. That sucks. That's it's, terrible. It's for you. horrible. You're yeah, poor man. Just looking for some thoughts and prayers. All right, if anybody one. has a job opening for this guy yeah, or they can get him out of this life, please call. Yeah. No, no, I'm kidding. No, that's yeah. awesome. That's that's the dream. That's that's yeah. Dream. Is this so? Is, is that your van? No. Yeah, that's the van. I just oh, did the whole like van so. conversion thing on it. Actually, is the second one. The first one was full on like moto van, had all the chocks in it and stuff. And then yeah. now we keep all the bikes here. So I just ripped the van apart and put it all back together. And uh, that, I'm like, and then I realized after doing this big van build and doing all the research and doing all the building and all the stuff, and you know, it's got the fridge and the shower and the bed and the, all that stuff. And then I realized. I'm really just an eight year old that made a fort. Yeah. Like I mean, that's, that, that's it. Yeah. But it's like a really cool fort. So, and, yeah. and everybody in our age would want to do the exact same thing, be an eight year old and build a fort yeah. with wheels on wheels on wheels. You and like, you think like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then I don't know if I'm going to use it and all this stuff. And it, it just like, you know, every day I'm just like hanging out and I'll throw up the hammock in the back and it's gotta be something out. with an instant, right? I just did the same thing. I just got the truck and immediately after I bought a mattress and a tent for it. I'm yeah. never sleep outside. Yeah. I've never slept in a, in a tent ever he, in my life. He's never camped. <laughs> I've never camped, but immediately after the same week, I bought I bought that tent. Like if I was gonna use it. You know what's funny is like everybody gets so like uh, overthinking like the van builds and stuff, and it gets it gets insane like how oh, yeah. how involved it gets. But when I ripped everything out and I just had a bunch of like Mexican blankets in the back, like it turns out an empty van with a bunch of Mexican blankets is pretty much just as good as like a totally built van. You're like. Yeah. I'm crashing this thing. I'm changing it. Like, wait, it's great. Yeah, I'm hauling whatever I want, you know? So yeah, full time. It'll have like all the surfboards and skateboards. And if I need to haul a bike, I can haul a bike. And, um, usually it's just from the track to the mechanic. Yeah. I have an engine builder and everything else is here. So yeah, that thing's cool. Yeah. It's, it's so awesome. I was actually talking to, to Jaime about, I would love to get one of these vans and just travel the country and do podcast and record and talk to people yeah. and, you know, bring some bikes in the back and do done. it. I'm like total uh, like van evangelist, you know, like, you know, like I remember thinking, oh, this would be cool. And it's actually cooler than I thought it was going to be. Like, yeah, it, I, it's super cool. I, I, there's nothing cooler. I mean, no, the I don't think cooler so. than that is no. probably a helicopter. I, I, I mean, that's just because I love helicopters. With lasers. With lasers and, yeah. and sharks with laser. So, they, yeah, you know. Yeah, that'd be but, good. But, yeah, you know, it's it's um, just from, like, the like the lifestyle thing, you know. Like, it's nice just having one vehicle with all the stuff in it, and you just take off and go, and you're you're yeah. good to go. Yeah, yeah. No, no limits, no boundaries. So how do you deal with the commute, San Diego Riverside? It, you know, I've driven it, like, I just calculated. I've probably done, like, a 1,000 school days, and it's I don't even, like, realize the drive anymore. So if I do back-to-back -back school days, I'll, you know, camp in the van. And uh, fucking amazing. James. You know, it was weird because like you can obviously you can do like, a, you know, it's a business. So you can do a write off. You can get a hotel and you can get. But after like driving and working all day, it's nice to like not go anywhere. It's nice just to like chill out and have a beer and cook a can of chili in the gas stove and, you know, nothing fancy and just have yeah. it, just kind of chill out. And yeah, it's just a one less mental thing to think about i i, I wonder I had, I had a good buddy of mine he was a director and every time he did like a video for for clients you had to pay for him but you also had to pay for him to use his cameras his gear his yeah. setup and i always thought that was weird i'm wondering because you stay in the van if you can bill yourself like as a identity separate yeah you know we're a corporation we do all that corporate yeah. You know, oh, so stuff it gets done. You, like oh. everything, everything's a write-off on that van. Everything, you know? yeah, uh, yeah. Because so. you're right. If you stay at a hotel, that's a write-off. Yeah, that's a write-off. If you stay off in your own van, that yeah. should be a write-off too. Also a write-off. Yeah, everything. You know, so the yeah. rent, the space that it takes up here. New on the subwoofer, write-off. Write-off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, new surfboard, new <laughs> write-off. Be a bit of a stretch, but yeah. if I put my sticker on it, it's advertising. Marketing. That's yeah, true. It's marketing. Yeah. That's true. So. Let, let, let's talk about, uh, for the listeners, who are you and what do you do? Uh, I'm Brian and I run uh, SoCal Supermoto and uh, I teach people how to ride motorbikes a little bit better and we uh, ride around in squiggly circles all day. That's awesome. And um, have a really good time. How'd you get started? Well, that's actually you could talk about how you got into motorcycles to begin with before you got into Oh, uh, yeah. Business. So I lived in San Francisco. I was on a uh, bus and um, we all know buses suck. And I looked out the window and there was a $500 sign on a i think it was a 74 cb 450 dual overhead cam quite high tech for the time yeah. so and i'm like i got 500 bucks and i hate the bus so that's how i got so you're using the bus as transportation yeah i was that, like taking the bus to work and i go if i i just give that guy 500 bucks i could take that thing to work yeah 
That's and then cool. got into writing. And so I did the whole like, you know, hipster cafe thing, you know, and with all vintage bikes. And then I wanted bikes that would um, stop. So then I got, uh, I got, I went from that to like a VTR 1000, like Super Hawk, the Super Chicken. I don't know if you know that bike, um, but it, just like a thousand CC, you know, sport bike uh, twin. And um, just started getting into that. And I think I fell in love with it because it was just, it allowed me to feel carving, like just like you carve on a surfboard or a skateboard. It's like, that's what got me into motorcycles was the feeling like you're carving and I could get that on my way to work, you know? So um, you know, you'd get burned out coming off work and get on your bike and you just, you just like, you just wake up. I mean, you guys know this, right? Like, so you work all yeah. day, you get on your bike, you ride home and then all of a sudden you're energized to do something else instead of just sitting Stay on your couch. And, yeah. Netflix so, and yeah, especially if you're in some crappy office job, you know, you get really kind of just exhausted from doing nothing. So, right. um, I think just like everybody else, I just fell in love with motorcycles and it's, it's that, I think it was that simple. And then, um, you know, just have a any riding prior to that, any dirt bike riding or any no, like I Mojave deserts or anything like that? No, I was kind of self-taught, which, you know, I don't recommend, but you know, I, I, <laughs> I learned in downtown San Francisco and I went across like the Golden Gate Bridge on my first day, total squid, like right. flea market helmet, t-shirt, you know, the whole super squid. And, um, yeah, that's how I got into, into riding and then just started doing, you know, just group rides and sport bikes and all that sort of stuff. And then... Um, that was pretty much it. And then I, I got uh, invited to a friend. He has a backyard motocross track and I didn't like dirt at the time at all, but I rode a YZ 250 dirt bike and I'm like, why aren't street bikes like this? And by like this, I mean fun, like super lightweight, super flickable, like incredibly fun to ride. And that's what led me to supermoto. So then I started researching supermoto and I, you know, put some, you know, supermoto wheels on my, whatever it was, LC4, you know, KTM at the time. This would have been like year 2000 or something. And, um, yeah, I couldn't get it. Like, I'm like, why doesn't everybody ride these bikes? They're so insanely fun. And, uh, that's what got me into, uh, supermoto. And then, um, yeah, everything just kind of act actually went after the other. I I'm sorry, Brian, how would you describe supermoto for, because this is, this has been a, pro a podcast of like broad riding. So right, Harley's. How would you describe a, a, a supermoto? Well, personally, I would describe it as, as a motorbike. Right. Well, which isn't gonna like <laughs> isn't what people want to hear. Right. You know, we live in a like it, everything's binary, right? Like this is the right way, this is the wrong way, and you know, a, a supermoto to me, I'm gonna say what it is officially later, but to me, yeah, yeah. it's just a dual sport bike, and a dual sport bike is made to go off road and on road with a bias towards off road. And to me, a supermoto bike is the exact same, just with a bias for on-road. So it has the same kind of thing. It just works a little bit better on the street, works a little bit worse in the dirt, but you can still take it wherever you want and, uh, and just ride the hell out of it. And it's super flickable and super fun, and they handle amazing. Um, so that's what they are to me. They're, um, I love all motorcycles. I love Harleys, scooters, like, you know, old, you know, Vespas, dirt bikes, everything. You know, any, any motorcycle with engine and two wheels i'm down and um except the katana like the late 90s that thing is a piece of shit but you know every other bike you know i just totally uh totally like them and then um that's what it was to me it was just the purest form of riding a motorcycle it was just an engine a seat and a handlebar and some and some tires and right. that's what i like about it and an led light barn <laughs> that's hanging <laughs> off one side or for something. sure yeah at least one uh, and then, you know, officially Supermoto is a bike that is designed to ride on a track that is 80% asphalt and 20% dirt. That's it. And so when I got into Supermoto, most people didn't have the 17 inch sticky tires. You would simply take a dirt bike, you would stick a, whole, a bigger brake on it if you could, um, some sportsman rubber, which is kind of like a dual sport, more street oriented rubber onto it, and you'd go racing. Yeah. Um, and you know, some people that were really serious had already, you know, you had to build the bike yourself. You couldn't really buy the stuff. You'd be lacing hubs and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, when you started in supermoto, and I say that now because now people say it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a dirt bike with 17 inch wheels. Right. You know? And so, and they'll actually say, oh, that's not a supermoto because it doesn't have 17s. What I always say is, let's say there's some old crusty guy at the track who can ride the hell out of a bike and he's on a 89 uh, you know, XR 600 with some street tires and he's, he's winning, you know, he's beating everybody. Are you going to say he's not on a, he's not riding a supermoto or he's not on a supermoto bike. It's a, it's a mindset. It's a style of riding. Um, and, uh, 
not uh, more than it is a uh, type of bike. But basically, if you're riding fast on a combo of, of asphalt and dirt, that's supermoto. Yeah, they're, they're badasses. I, I recently just got into them. Uh, Jaime just bought one. We just had Spicoli on the podcast. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you know her. Yeah, I know Spicoli. Yeah, so we, we you know, I got, we got to sit down. She was she, Her episode actually just released this Wednesday, and it was it was very interesting how she got into it and what it's turned into and what it's mm-hmm. being. And that's why we're sitting down with you now and, you know, trying to pick your brain. So what made you, uh, you, you loved it, you got into it. What made you find Riverside and open a place like this? Um, so I had this little, uh, you know, supermoto. That was my personal bike. And then I had friends I needed to take the DMV test. I'll try to make the story quick. No, no, so no. I we, would, we, there's no time limit. <laughs> like, so I would... Uh, only talked for two and a half hours. Oh, man. So um, I would loan my bike out to friends that needed to take the DMV test because it's a tight little circle. And it's yeah. like a pain in the ass on a Harley or even worse on a sport bike. So then it, I'm like, wow, it seems like a lot of people like to do this. So I started the DMV test bike. I got a little TW200. And if you ever were like Craigslist for like years, it was like DMV test bike. That, that was me. And it, every Tuesday I'd go to the DMV and, you know, hang out there and people would use my bike to take the test. And then I would think like some of these people suck and need some help. And, um, and so I started training them in parking lots. And then, so we did parking lot training. And then I was like, uh, I was getting back into track riding and I go, you know, if I can't really, I can only teach them so much in a parking lot. So if I could, if I could just get them to the supermoto track, we don't need to go to like a full road race track. If I can just get them a supermoto track, we could really work on all this stuff. And then, so when I went to buy myself a bike, I bought two bikes and then plus that little TW 200. And I had, I put them all in the back of my truck and I came here to Adams Motorsports Park and walked in and was like, I'm going to do a supermoto school today. And they're like, okay, <laughs> and that's how it started. Just, no, really? So it was that casual? It was that casual. And it was, um, I think I had a class of like four students or five students and they were like sharing bikes. So I advertised on some like, you know, uh, motorcycle forum and made it super cheap. And, um, and then it just started taking, I, I thought when I started this, what was going to happen is it was such a niche. It was like a niche of a niche. You had like motorcycle, you had motorcycle track days and then you had dirt bikes and you had like supermoto, and it's like such a sub of everything else. So I thought like the, you know, hundred people that wanted to do it, we're going to do it. And then I was going to go out of business <laughs> you know? yeah. and then everybody just started coming back again and again and bringing their friends and it just started growing and growing and growing. So, um, yeah, that was 10 years ago. And now we have like 24 bikes. We run around 80 school days a, a year and, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's, I, but I, it's I still, say, congratulations. That's amazing. Oh, thanks. That's a great, st- you know, success story as an entrepreneur and, yeah, you know, vision. I mean, we made all the uh, the whole like if I could change certain things, like I look at mistakes I made. I'm like, I can't believe I did that. But you know, like um, that's part of the whole process, just learning and, and trekking along. But it is kind of a you know bootstrap American dream kind of thing. You know, it was a ton of work, and it really just kept plugging along, kept doing it, kept doing it, and then uh, yeah, now it just kind of seems like it took a life of its own. I, 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 we start the day by saying like, thank you for signing up because as I was mentioning, like our marketing budget is zero. Most of our schools sell out. And, um, I had one of our team riders back in the day, Tim, we, I was stressing about all the business stuff, right? I was talking about how, you know, whatever was going through my mind that day, this problem with this bike or this person or bookings, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, he said, the only thing that matters, we had like five students at the time. The only thing that matters is if those five people are having fun. And so that's been the focus ever since day one, like it's really easy to get lost in everything, but as long as you're focused on your students and they're having a good time, then everything else is going to work itself out. Yeah. And that's been the, uh, that's honestly the model. It's that number one focus is on having a good time. And then, cause when people are having fun, they learn better and they're safer. So make them have a good time. And, uh, teach them a bunch of stuff along the way. We, we do kind of a kitchen sink approach where I'm just throwing techniques and training at them all day long. And uh, most time it's not going to stick and, you know, and then they just come back and do the school again. So um, that's been the, uh, that's been the model. And after 10 years and all these students and all this stuff, it's still just me and my friends. And, you know, sometimes my girlfriend will come out and join and that's rad. And, um, and then you just post up at the end of the day and drink some beers and hang out and kick <laughs> yeah. the shit. And yeah, that's, yeah, sometimes it's, it's ridiculously hard. I mean, I was joking the other day. I'm like, hey, look, I'm a CEO as I was filling 10 gas cans. You know, yeah. like you just, you know, hauling around gas and bikes and, and lifting the generator in and out or, you know, whatever the case is. It's just a ridiculous amount of work. And then other times, 
you know, you just ran the track all day and then you're kicking back with your friends and having a beer and it's a beautiful evening. And I just go like, I can't believe I get, <clears throat> you know, paid to do this. So yeah, I never take any of it for, for granted. I, I'm super thankful for all of our students that they, I, I'd say at the beginning of the day, like you guys are the reason I don't have to get a real job. Like this job's a pain in the ass, but I love it. And you know, yeah, I couldn't, but I'm I couldn't sure. do it without them. So um, that's, that's what it's about. I'm sure everybody that comes here feels the opposite. They, they couldn't do or ride or have the confidence they need unless if you were here. So it, it, it goes hand in hand. Yeah. Question. Do do you think, um, your classes are only for supermotor bikes or do you think it, it any, everybody would benefit from it? And yeah, I kind of no. know the answer, but no, it's definitely, no. In, you know, it's, it's, again, we actually say in the class, like, um, I don't care if you never ride supermoto again, like you will because they're ridiculously fun, but we don't teach asphalt. We don't teach dirt. We teach riding to the traction you have. And that's, that's the magic. That's where everything starts to click together. And if, even if they don't listen to me, if you just get on a supermoto bike and you just ride a ton of laps on a supermoto bike, the bike gives such good feedback. You know, you do something wrong and it wiggles all over the place, you know, and it, but usually without crashing. So the bikes give amazing feedback and everything you learn translates directly over to whatever bike you ride. So after riding supermoto, you know, you get on your sport bike, you're going to get a little bit more comfortable or your Harley or anything. You're going to get a little bit more comfortable with the bike wiggling around on you, right? You get into a situation where you go into a turn and you lose the rear end and a, a new rider will automatically cut the throttle and then high side, right? Well, experience in dirt, experience with supermoto, you develop that muscle memory of you, you dealing with micro traction losses all day long and you develop even subconsciously, um, a knowledge that using the throttle can regain traction. And so it just teaches that. So no matter what you normally ride or whatever you like to ride, um, it'll translate directly over. And again, to me, they're just motorbikes. I mean, I know everybody has their camps, you know, like everybody's right. like, I'm a sport, oh, I'm a sport bike guy. And I get people that are like sport bike riders or say, do I have to run the dirt? And I always say, well, if you're never going to ride dirt ever again, you should ride the hell out of the dirt as much as you can today, you know, because yeah. nothing's going to, you know, get you trained up better than that. So um, I can't remember what the original question was. I just started rambling on about traction <laughs> control. And no, no, that's a, that's no, a if, if it was applicable, If it was applicable to, if it was applied to all riders. Yeah. You, you learn oh, yeah. Different style rider. The, like, I could have just said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. You could have, but that wouldn't have been interesting. That it's absolutely true. I mean, it's going to translate directly over. Yeah, to, to everybody. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So personally, what, what do you ride in the street? I don't. Yeah. I, I don't ride street bikes anymore. I did actually, I just converted one of my school bikes to, I'd put some dirt wheels on it and I'm going to put some Dunlop D606 like Enduro tires on there. And so this is the first time in, I think 12 years that I'm going to have a personal bike and it's still just a DRC, <laughs> you know, but, uh, I'm so busy with, I have another job. I work at a hospital doing CAT scans. Um, and, uh, and then I do, Lately, because of COVID, we just doubled or tripled our number of days. So the class sizes are half. And then to compensate for that, we're just adding dates. So um, I work a ridiculous amount. And so generally, if I do have a day off, since I spend so much time with motorcycles, I'm usually going to go surf or skate or snowboard or something. Um, but do uh, all of them at the same time. Yeah. Same day yeah. At least. Man, I'm too old for that. Yeah. But, but now, yeah. And I was like, you know what? We got the fleet up to spec and you know i'm like i'm gonna go ahead and just keep this one and put some dirt dirt bike wheels on it and cruise around that's that's one way to do it I, I had a quick question you were talking about um you briefly said that people used to rent out your bikes at the to, you know for the dmp yeah. um and then you said street bikes are harder than harleys to do oh, it a million times harder yeah, I, yeah. I, i've never i mean i did mine on a street glide yeah you know which people yeah. thought that was nuts but that felt very comfortable and very no nah, it, it's all about turning radius honestly so the street bikes are the yeah worst. they have the, no turning radius so basically when you go to make that tight little circle your clip on hits Done. the tank and then you end up putting your foot down and then that's a that's a fail so mm. yeah that interesting. was interesting i did that for like 13 years every tuesday down at the uh dmv but i escaped that yeah four I, I, years I, ago or something i i've told the story on the on the on the, on the podcast before it was uh basically this guy was gonna let me borrow a scooter for a six pack of beer <laughs> and uh, i was supposed to meet with him in the morning he didn't show up and yeah. I, I just had my street glide at that point yeah. i just said fuck it go for it so no it did pass it was great yeah for everybody doing out there it's, you can do it on harley just don't look at the front wheel yeah yeah it was like the biggest thing that was like my that's job. true here my job is telling people to get their junk up on the tank like far up on the bike right. and at the dmv was telling people to stop looking at your front wheel 
That's yeah. basically it. Yeah, I've heard that. For me, it was uh, it, w- it was giving gas while holding the back brake. Yeah, and it stood little, up the bike yeah. where I had zero effort to keep it up. Yeah, totally. And, and that was like a little tip. I saw your YouTube video. You, 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 how active have you been doing that? I saw the five tips, you know, the common yeah. mistakes and stuff. Yeah, I just started. I mean, we kind of did it initially when we got started. And then the school got just really busy. And it was just really just trying to keep everything going here. And then it was funny. Like, you know, we're like, where's like people are kind of entitled for their free videos. They're like, where's my video? I'm like, well, I'm busy running a school, dude. I can't make your video. Sorry. You right. know? And, uh, but it was, it was kind of funny. I always thought that was hilarious. Like, you know, I'm not getting paid to do this, you know, but, and then we just started, um, just started it again. So we're doing, we have a whole backlog of really cool ideas that we want to do for, for a vlog. And, um, so like yesterday we shot or the day before, um, like, uh, the DRZ, everyone talks about how like slow the DRZ is. And, you know, anybody who rides at the track knows the DRZ is slower, but it's not that much slower. So we're like, let's calculate exactly how slow the DRZ is. So then we put one of our semi-pro riders, one of our instructors, on his bike and then on a school bike, recorded lap times and compared them and have all the footage and stuff. So that's the next video that's coming out if I ever get around to uh, to editing it. But well, um, Yeah, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, it's all, everything's just coming up with um coming up with time but you know and managing that but yeah i think we got it kind of down now so you know, they're not the greatest videos in the world but I, I can i can knock them out pretty quick and throw it up so yeah it's just the socal supermoto youtube channel yeah i think all the motorcycle people need the content content you know i think people are always looking and searching i mean it's not a big niche you know motorcycles i think it's yeah. like three percent in the united states mm-hmm. but there, there's enough people that that are looking for that content definitely they're passionate so they're passionate you can so yeah, yeah. The way I like to think about it is like everybody has their place, like, and you kind of have to hit everything. So there's like people that are like old dudes that are just Facebook, other people just Instagram, other people just YouTube, other people just podcasts. And so you kind of just kind of throw that, throw it out, see what sticks. And, you know, so that's kind of what we're, what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, that's how we got here. Yeah. You know, just, just trying different things out, you know, collaboration, sponsorships, Instagram. And then all of a sudden we're, we're doing a podcast, you know, and the, it seems like it's beginning. Yeah. Like, I can't keep up with any of it. Like if I get a, you know, post up one or two things, like people seem to be like professional, like Instagrammers. And if I can get like a picture or two up and it, it's kind of sad because we actually have all kinds of really cool video, all, and tons of stills and all this stuff, like really cool stuff. And it's just, there's just so much time. You it, know? It's, 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 it's amazingly simple and difficult, you know, to, to run and manage an Instagram page. It's also like this whole uh, life balance thing. And I was just talking about this this morning because I like, you know, I pulled all these like tires out of my van and it's like, a, you know, like it's 25 brand new Dunlops and it looks pretty cool. And I'm like, it, it changes the way you look at things. Like instead of just, it takes you out of the moment, right? Like normally it's just like me and talking to my friend, like, and then it becomes like, a, oh, I should share this. <clears throat> you know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's the same thing with being a photographer. It's like a curse, oh, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. Definitely. Like you can't just like go and look at something pretty. Like all of a sudden you got to look at like uh, the lighting and what I'm going to do. And what's it? Like you can't, you know, just simply enjoy stuff and be in the, in the moment. And that's, that would be like one of my dreams. Like if I could, like my, uh, my fantasy is like one day I'm like, oh, I'll have one motorcycle and I won't be on social media. Like, right. you know, like <laughs> that's no. my, that's my current, uh, current dream and i'll just like hang out in my van and surf and, and ride you know for and just stay present yeah yeah i mean that's that's just uh, i think that's also um consistent with any business owner you ne- you're never off i always say it's like it's kind of like being in school and you'd have like a paper like there's always projects to do there's always something that you should be focused on or you should be doing and uh so that's kind of the downside of being an entrepreneur is that you're always on you're always on you know it's really hard to turn it off it's really hard to get that you, you're that always on ideas are always being created and you don't know what's right and what's wrong and most of the shit you probably do is going to be wrong but you know you learn something from it and yeah. you continue you know until yeah. you hopefully get it right yeah and i don't think anybody ever gets it right i think it's just a never-ending you know fucking yeah. journey of, of you know, trying to be <laughs> whatever. fucking successful yeah, whatever when, when something yep. works it never stops if right you look at yourself like yeah. you keep working unlimited amount of hours in this so it keeps working right and with the when the covid stuff done we couldn't have we didn't have schools for a month and a half like i was saying like right now it feels like um like when you have a sick kid like you want to be there like right. even if there's somebody else that could take care of the kid like you want to like you're you like, want to I, I feel kind of that way right now so 
I've actually taken like days off my other gig in order to run school days here. Cause I just like right now during this transition, I just felt like I like wanted to be here myself, you know? So you're, you're here in Riverside, you live in San Diego, you work at the hospital. And I think you mentioned that you were in a band or you're in a band. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. Like the amount of stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. I'm in a, I'm in a band, lonesome lowdowns, lonesome lowdowns.com. Shout out. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. I guess that's the list of stuff like band, surfing, skateboarding, you know, kids. This isn't in priority. Just snowboarding, and snowboarding. And then the business. Um, yeah, just yeah, really, really busy. What about traveling? Um, like any world global world traveling? I did that like so much in my 20s and I kind of in a way burned out on it. That lasted. And, but now I'm starting to get the bug again. Like I want to go to. I want to do like a surf trip, Portugal. I just want to go to Portugal and grab like a van and stuff like surfboards in there and a mattress and just go up and down the coast surfing. That's like my latest, you know, that sounds travel, like a great travel fantasy. Have so. you ever, have you ever taught supermoto or had, you know, writing classes out outside of Riverside or in a different state, different country? I mean, we used, when we were smaller, we would go to the different tracks. We'd go, definitely not different state. We, we, I got one time I got a call to go to Philippines, but that didn't work out. Um, but, um, and then I've had a lot of people encourage, like, what you know, get a semi truck and start traveling with this and all that sort of stuff. And it's just like, like you would do with like the superbike school or something. And uh, it just, it's just too, like, I get exhausted just even thinking about it. Like, I'd yeah. rather have, you know, one third the amount of people, but just have have it here and just have like a home track and um, have it easy and cool. Yeah, you and have it fun easy. And yeah. yeah, you know, people all the time. Well, when are you going to come to New York? And I'm like, why? Why don't you come here? Like, you just bring you. <laughs> I have to bring 25 bikes. How about you just bring you? Yeah. And then and fucking hang out in California, hang out in California. enjoy yeah. it. Take a picture of the Hollywood sign. And yeah, you know, fucking it's cool. Every winter we get the, like the Canadian migration. Like, yeah. It, like every winter, like all the, all the Canadians start coming down and then you, New Yorkers and you know, all the cold weather people start coming out, which is brilliant. Cause it's hot. Frankly, it's hot here in the right. summer. It's still fun. we got the double, you know, air conditioning classroom now. Thank God. But, um, yeah, but in the winter, like it's it's this place is awesome. It's like 65, 70 degrees. It doesn't usually rain. It's like green. It's actually pretty. So, um, yeah, that's an ideal time to to do the school. Yeah, I I think this whole area, Riverside, and then Palm Springs would be the next you know major desert is mm -hmm. perfect. Uh, what is it? Uh, November till April. Yeah, it's just paradise weather. Yeah, for sure. Well, New but York and Canada and all these other fucking states. I'm sure they're awesome, and I want to go there. I just well during busy those with my times. little school. Yeah, yeah, but during those times, yeah. I mean, it's just buried in snow. Yeah. What's what, what are you what are you thinking about doing? Uh, what's the future for you guys? What are you guys gonna head to? Are you guys gonna do like travel packages, flight packages, like maybe even do a New York package and say, hey, do the class and flights yeah. included? I mean, honestly, we do the In and Out Burger thing. Oh, that's cool. What, it's kind of like you know, you like get, you go there and it's like cheeseburger, hamburger, shake, fries. Well, I want this. Uh, you know, fuck it, you can't have it. You know what I mean? It just makes it a lot easier and more. I, I hate one thing. I hate is when like. I'm not saying motorcycle schools, but just businesses in general, they start doing all these add-ons. Oh, you want the photo package? Okay, the photo package is forty nine ninety nine. You know, right. so for us now we raise rates a little bit, so it's two ninety nine, and that's bike training, track fees, photography, t shirt, lunch. Um, we give out you know some swag and high fives and call it a day. And and it that, just makes that's, it that's one day, two days. That's one day. That's one day. Uh, all inclusive, and so it just makes it like so easy. Like, well, can I have this? No. But uh, just no, just come out. You're going to dig it, you know, like, and um, it just makes running the business easier. And then that's what I like as a consumer. Right. Like you know, they call it the, uh, the paradox of choice, which is basically people are more likely to spend um, until they have too many choices and then they spend less. I'm like that. I can, I can only shop at Trader Joe's. If I go in Vons, I freak out. I'm like, yeah. there's like 16 different mayos. I, 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 I need one mayo. I do that shit with the, with the vending machine. I, <laughs> as soon as I go to the vending machine, I go, fuck, man. Like, I, I don't, I wanted water, but the Diet Coke and the regular Coke and the Pepsi. Yeah. It, 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 is, it, is, uh, it is challenging. There's too many choices. But I could there. just be my bias, you know, yeah. but that's, it's worked for us. And that's what I really like doing, just making it really good value and just making it simple and, if it um, ain't broken, and don't, you know. Don't yeah, it. and it's the, the vibe is always like, you know, we're here. We're having a good time when you're ready. Come join us. There's never a hard push, you know, like, well, yeah. I can't do it and do this. And maybe if you do this, well, whenever you're ready, you know, we're going to be here. We do this year round and, you know, we've been here 10 years. We're planning on being here another 10 years. So uh, it's nice that we're in a position now that everything, we can just look at it long term. We don't have to like, you know, 
chase a booking or like, okay, yeah, I guess I can do that, but you want to ride this bike and you know, we can just be like, this is what we're doing. It's really cool. And hope you can join us. And that's kind of the mindset. Out of the COVID times, which are weird times for everyone, mm -hmm. um, how many, how many people pass through the school every month? So zero in like March and April, you know, and then what we, then as soon as the track opened up, then we could go to kind of like half size classes. So in the, you know, it's, it, we keep it very simple. You know, we're basically sanitizing the hell out of everything, wiping down all the bikes. Uh, mass no, no, on I, mean, the I mean, without counting the COVID uh -huh. times. Yeah. Usually, oh, just in general, yeah, uh, like a thousand, like a thousand students a year. A year. A thousand a year. Yeah. Okay. Now, so. now the summer months, are you guys open, like fully actively open when it's super fucking yeah. hot? Like yeah, I tell, I tell, I'm like, I just tell people like, don't book it now. And they yeah. go, uh, but uh, I'm going to book it now. And I go, okay. okay. And then, yeah. So the summer days all sell out, you know, it's, it's fine. It's when people are traveling and stuff. Yeah. And it's not bad. It used to be bad when we didn't have the classroom. It was super hot. And, um, but now it's not a big deal. You go out there, you get sweaty and dirty, you come out here and chill in the air conditioning for like you know, 20, 30 minutes, I teach you something, you get kind of refreshed, have something to drink, go back out on the track. So honestly, it's the summers, bad. it's not that bad. And, you know, it's sounding like the whole cheesy West Coast thing. It's like the whole dry heat. It is a dry heat. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, so so what, 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 what's the class? And let's just go over the package. Mm -hmm. So you pay two ninety nine. you get into the class. What, what do I have to bring a helmet? Do I have to bring boots? What, what does it include? What do I expect throughout the day? Yeah, so we'll just say during normal times, um, you know, you don't have to do it, bring anything. You can bring snacks if you want. Basically, just during non-COVID times, you just, because um, right now we're just not doing like food. Like we usually provide food and we're not having people share food and, uh, and do a lot of gear rental and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, you can basically show up, I say, bring whatever gear you have, then we can kind of fill in the gaps. So we do have the, all the gear we have is just a courtesy, you know, we just have a bunch of leathers and helmets and boots and stuff. And so if you need something, you're welcome to it. It's free. There's no like upcharge for, for gear rental or anything like that. Um, but you come here, you sign in at the office, get an armband. And like I said, everything's taken care of for you. So you just come in the classroom, we have you sign your life away on a release and, um, you know, the first session out on the track is just lead follow. Like uh, I literally give the homework assignment of uh, ride around and uh, don't crash. That's the, you know, first yeah. time out on the track, we're just going slow, cruising around, getting some heat in the tires, seeing where the track goes, seeing how the bike feels. And then every time we come back, I give the students a new homework assignment. So, all right, we're going to work on in slow, out fast. We're going to work on being smooth by not having the suspension move or whatever the case may be. We have a bunch of different drills that will run during the day. And uh, halfway through the day, when people are looking good on the asphalt, we open up the dirt section. So the track is 80% asphalt, 20% dirt. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be running that for the rest of the day. And usually around three o'clock, you know, I'm teaching and I look out and everybody's just like spaced out. You know, they're just so exhausted and tired. So like, all right, <laughs> right, we're gonna, we're gonna free ride now. And then um, we just end the day with some, uh, you know, the staff will, you know, the staff that's been working all day, they'll hop on bikes and go join the students and just rip around and um, and then we just pack up around four thirty, five o'clock and me, I drive back to San Diego and upload a bazillion pictures and do a little bit of editing and stuff. And then we send an email out with everybody's pictures. And, um, yeah, like I said, just try to keep it as simple and as, as fun as possible. That's always the, uh, that's always a priority. Just ripping yeah, around and having a good time. Just <clears throat> keep it, keep it simple. Uh, and then would you recommend this for anybody, depending like for a new rider that's never ridden for a professional rider? Or do, do the classes separate based <clears throat> on riding experience? And do you, yeah. need, and do you need the license to? Yeah, no. Jump yeah. Good question. It. So um, don't need a license because we're on private property. So you need to have basic control of the motorcycle. So go, go forward, turn left, turn right, stop the bike. You're good. You know, if you're a new rider, that's only the, done the MSF course and maybe had a couple days on a bike. We have those little TTR 125s. We can put them on that and lead them around the track. And what's interesting is that when we've had like, you know, advanced racers out and they're new to supermoto, right? And then we've had in the same class, like uh, a new rider who's only been riding like a, a couple months. And what's fascinating is I'm, a lot of times I'm telling them the same thing, right. you know, less, especially a lot of the supermoto specific stuff. So I don't know why it works, but it totally works having riders at different levels because that was always a design like do we need to do level one level two level three and instead as i mentioned before we just do the kitchen sink but we just throw stuff at them all day and so with the more advanced riders more of that will stick and some of the super new riders they might be just focused on counter steering and steering with their chin and staying and breathing and staying loose on the bike and that's great because that's what they need and i can i can actually tell riders like you can pretty much ignore you know this 
talk about trail breaking or, you yeah. know, whatever this case may be. You're not there. And what I mostly need you to do is just um, focus on <clears throat> just breathing and relaxing and, and having a good time. And what I'll tell with uh, a lot of new riders is that, um, you know, like none of this advanced technique stuff does you any good at all if you're tense. Yeah. So it's it's almost like that's one of the main battles is just getting to people to uh, to relax. relax. Yeah, that's and that that's interesting because just looking at at how teachers and how people teach, they usually want people to be stressed out and be like on you know on on their tip of, you know tip of the toes and yeah. kind of like what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And yeah. you know, the teachers like that, but you know any anything you do, you should just be fucking relax and accept it. Yeah, and then even if you wanted to get like you know you you'll find out the truth that way when people are relaxed and in same thing with uh when they're riding no it's it's the opposite you know i just like make fun of them or make fun of myself or crack jokes and you know it's because the you need people to be loose if they're if they're tight if they're stressed out um they're not having fun and they're not riding safe so yeah. that's the uh that's the rub yeah every, everything's robotic they're 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 viewing limited they're turning limited they're thinking about everything yeah, yeah it's definitely a bad way to, to you know ride. when i tell people is that we've we've done this so long like we know everything you're gonna do wrong right and um so it, basically like we know how to get you faster we know how to get you safer um it's just gonna take a little bit of time so we just need you to go slow because you can go slow and suck that's fine you can go fast and ride really well you just can't suck and go fast, right? Yeah. Like, you're like, I got this. Like, you know, like, no. dude out in the school, like, I got this. And we're like, what we do is I kind of make a deal with the students. I go in the morning, we're going to work on technique. We're going to go really slow. We're going to work on um, just getting used to the bikes and the track and learning the techniques. And in the afternoon, nobody's going to tell you to slow down. So, and then when we do it that way, they don't develop bad habits. They don't crash. They don't get hurt. They ride longer. So there's no downside in it at all. And, that's been working really well, but it's just all these really small changes that we just, you just learn. I learn from my students. I learn from other people I ride with, um, learn from just experience and we kind of fine tune the whole thing. So now we have really like strict curriculum, but it certainly didn't start that way. It just kind of developed and see, yeah. you know, see what works. It makes sense that it would get, it'd be pretty strict. Yeah. So yeah, is, it's, it's is, great. Is, uh, accidents, um, are there accidents or yeah, and have yeah. they dropped over the years because of getting stricter? Huge. Oh man. Yeah, well, you want to do I guess that's, percentages that's probably off? the, uh, I mean, in an average day we have this new coating on the track. It's super sticky. We, I think we had one crash today. I think lately we've had zero to one crashes. Um, in the old days, like before we had that focus, people would just go for it. Like I remember there's like a dude crashed three times in a session like in a one 20 minute like session. And so there's been a big um, change in emphasis and just all kinds of little things. Like at the beginning of the day, we'll put stickers on the track that mark turn in points and that prevents people from turning in too early and then to giving additional inputs and crashing. So um, yeah, little, all kinds of little changes that we made have greatly reduced um, crashes. And what I tell people is like, okay, if you know what you're doing, and you're hauling ass around some sweeper and you're going 70 miles an hour on your high side. I'm like, okay, that's a good story. That's a good, that's a good crash, right? But if you're just new and you have cold tires and you turn in too early and you break your clavicle, like there's yeah. nothing cool about it. You know what nothing. I mean? So there's no real function in riding above your, your level. Yeah. You know, you're not, you're not going to impress us. I, I think that's one of the top <clears throat> accidents. And again, I've probably said this so many times, but I, the two top ones are uh, turns. People just taking turns. They go into the other lane. They go yeah. off a cliff. But turns is a is a big accident and uh, intersections. You know, yeah. they just think they can. They're faster than the car, and the car is making the left. Oh but yeah, the, the whole left hand turn in front. Yeah, that, that I just seen too many of those. Yeah, I in that it happens during the school. I, I actually say I'm like I'm gonna get serious with you for 20 seconds. You know, like and I talk about this crash that happens where people turn in too early and then they go into the the tires and I go, what happens yeah. in this situation is they get dirty. I have friends that are dead. I have friends that are paralyzed from doing that exact mistake, yeah. but they did it on the street. So right. it's like, this is the place to screw up. If you're going to make the mistakes, like this is the place to do it where the consequences are like, you know, now every once in a while we'll have like a broken ankle, <clears throat> you know, but injuries are way down and Ooh, yeah, yeah, it's been, it's going, going good, but little things, you know, like, Tires are super sticky. The track is great. Turn in markers, keeping them slow, you know, and then that works out really, really well. That's fucking awesome. How often do you have to do service on these bikes? 
constantly are running all the time. Yeah, it's like you know the whole painting a bridge thing. When you finish painting a bridge and then you start painting the other side again. You like you never actually yeah. stop painting it. Um, so every morning we do like a, just the basic check. So we're taking pads, water, oil, tire pressures, tire like that's and that's on all all bikes. Um, and then fix little. We have like little tip overs and stuff like that in the dirt all the time. So we'll be fixing levers or controls or whatever the case is during the day. And then we do um, frequent, semi-frequent oil changes and frequent tire changes. And then back in the day, it's like the whole thing, like things I learned, you know, I kind of held on to the bikes too long. So now we just, we'll have perfectly good bikes and we'll just sell them just to, and then get a, buy another fresh bike. And it's not like the person who's getting it is getting some, they're getting a pretty hammered bike, but it's usually a lot of times like I'll do that and the bike will just keep running forever. But yeah. that saves us the hassle of having to do like motor builds or anything like that. So like if there's uh, any one bike in the fleet, and I'm like, I just tell my staff, I'm like, if there's a bike you don't like, just get rid of it. We're like, we don't need to spend, you know, th- as a business, it doesn't make sense to spend all kinds of times getting things sorted. Just sell it, get another one and uh, keep going. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, and then actually the oil changes, how often do those oil changes have to be done? You know, Nicole told us we're every, every, seven every five hours minutes or something. Yeah. Every five minutes. Every, or every, yeah, yeah. Every, every, I mean, see that's racist. So it's different. I mean, right. it is, yeah. With, with performance bikes, it's, uh, I mean the DRZ is like the, the, like Honda civic of motorcycles and it just keeps going. Like, so we just throw some oil in it. Like, honestly, I don't even, maybe every couple months we'll throw you know oh. some oil in there so it's not it's, that often it's not that like right now we're just going through the fleet so they just did like they'll do like six oil changes a day yeah and then we'll let it go for a couple months and then go and do it again so we don't have any like strict schedule where we're looking at this and that it's just the no amount of miles or hours that you guys measure. we don't even we don't even me- it's too much we got too many bikes you know yeah. <laughs> it's like it, we you could spend I mean, you, you do check the, the, the level and oh yeah all the time it. so basically when you have a good running bike that runs a little bit rich so it doesn't get too hot and doesn't get too overworked, right? So we'll, we'll jet the carbs so they run a little bit rich. Um, we'll set them up initially. We'll get fresh oil, fresh water, fresh tires, fresh brake pads, and then ride the hell out of it. That's the whole point of having a DRZ is not having to like, oh, I got 10 hours, I got to adjust my valves or change the oil or, you know, whatever. So I couldn't imagine, um, honestly, I couldn't imagine doing this with any other bike. Yeah. Is there is there any other thing you want to cover on the the podcast? No, man. Just uh, any messages, any words of advice, any, any wisdom. I would well, like I everybody to pray question. for world peace. Oh, you world know. peace. So, how many people repeat the course? Most of them. So it's good. It's actually an. No, That's a great question. It's um every class I always ask like who's done the school before, and it's almost every single time it's a third to a half the class. So usually there's like somewhere between like four and six riders in the class who have already done the, done the class. Um, so, yeah, that happens, that happens all the time. Because I was telling you at the beginning before we started that um, every single person that has recommended us to come talk to him is because everybody that, do, that does Multiple it has times. a great experience here. And, yeah. and they all, like, love, you know. Yeah, it's all, it's all family. Like, all these guys that are out riding, every single time we go to the track, they're all the old students. It's like they're you know? paying you to hang out. So they yeah. do, well, they'll do the school, like, two or three times and get right. the hang of it, and then they get addicted to Supermoto because that's how it is. And then they buy a Supermoto, and then they buy, like, a van, and then, and then they're here all the time, and you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so, like, it's so cool. Just, like, and they'll all have just regulars will, like, take my students to the side and be like, hey, you need to do this or whatever. You know, it's just all one big family and, and supermoto is like you just go over to like anybody in the pits you might know them might not really know them you'd be like man that's a sweet bike they'd be like take it out like it happens all the time like you just go hey give it a go you know that's fine. and i'm not saying that's 100 percent of people but that happens, but a, happens lot. a lot yeah you can so it gives you the opportunity to just try all different kinds of stuff and um it's it's super fun so but, so, uh, the, so my question would be i have to get the bike first then the van or the van then the bike Oh man, you better just get them both <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, just just paint them the same just, fucking just color full and just get them with yeah. same financing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, I mean, um, yeah. As far as just, I think it's just come. I would say just do all the schools. You know, like yeah. that's probably the best money you're gonna spend. Like go do Rich Oliver's and Mystery School, Flat Track School, and then uh, you know do the California Superbike School. Whatever. I'm not right. Saying yeah, no, one no, or the course. other. Like just just if the, do if them this, all. This business is so hard that if somebody's been around. They're probably pretty good, right? And nobody has any like 
a monopoly on the knowledge. You know, like, you know, like I'm the, I'm the chosen one. I know these things that the other schools don't know. It's all, it's all delivering a lot of the same material delivered a little bit different and it'll suit different styles. And, uh, that's, that's the best money you can spend on, on motorcycles. I would say that would be my, like, as far as what I would want to end on, I would say, go to schools. They're super fun. And learning how to ride properly makes motorcycles safer, duh, but also a lot more fun. That's what people don't focus on. A lot of times they focus on like the safety thing. Right. And then the other thing is I would just say, um, if as long as I'm just up here giving unsolicited, unsolicited advice to the world, you know, don't take it so seriously. You know, like everybody, like I said before, is kind of like, no, I'm an enduro guy. I'm a dirt bike guy. I'm like, they're just motorbikes. They're toys. Like they're toys that can kill you. So you kind of got to get trained in them and you got to respect them. But at the end of the day, that's what they're here for. They're here as like implements of, joy (laughs) but it's true you know like so just ride all the things ride it ride it all they're they're all super fun don't pigeonhole yourself into one style of riding or identity identifying with a type of bike like that's so you you would practically say ride boundless yeah be limitless yeah just just get on and go get on and go yeah so um, if you if you had to pick one only one motorcycle to wake up tomorrow and ride yeah and you don't work uh-huh. On, on this uh, track and, and doing the courses, yeah. what would you pick? Oh, man, I'm going to give you the most old man answer ever. I love, like, just, like, a DR650 dual sport bike. Like, just, like, the the oldest, geekiest, air-cooled dinosaur. Like, I love just a bike that just, like, the type of bike you just get on and not think about a thing, and it's not going to, like, flick you off or kill you, and you can just ride miles and miles and miles. Um, so... Yeah, just like I like an old air cooled dual sport. That's like what I'm in because then it's just it's actually more about the ride than it is about because most bikes are way beyond the ability of the rider, including me, like way beyond my ability. So it's kind of more fun to get on uh, just small, just in general, just small, simple bikes. I wish I had a better answer for that one. But um, yeah, that lately that's what I've been hankering towards. It's just like I said, I just converted this DRZ, so I'll go dual sport riding with a DRZ and some dirt wheels, but, um, it's, I can't even pick one. I like a lot of bikes. Yeah. And, and you shouldn't limit yourself to just one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but no, prove, but that, that prove is, it, you have 25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus. I know. And the, and the worst part is we have multiple bikes. You know, yeah. It's, it's really and hard. We don't even work on it. Yeah. But which one do you actually ride? Like how many bikes do you have? And then which one, like I read this cycle cycle world story a long time ago and it's about voting with your keys. And like, so what's your favorite bike? And people would be like, oh, oh my, my, my 1199 Panigale or whatever. Yeah. And then, cause they think that's what they're supposed to say, but pay attention and actually look at the what, mileage. Look at what keys you grab every time you go out to your garage. I, and I, if you I, always I, grab the, the dirt bike or the Harley. I have a dilemma. I, I yeah. really do. Um, I, I have a 2020 street line, Harley Davidson. Mm-hmm. I got a 2020 GSA, uh, you know, BMW GSA. Yeah. And and when I had the Harley before the GSA, I was riding the Harley obviously all the time. Then I got the GSA and I did not ride the Harley. And now three months in, I, recently I've been riding more. Well, now the, the BMW, the, I mean, they both had no miles. The BMW has almost 4,000 uh, miles and the Harley has almost 2,000. But recently I've been riding it much more. Yeah, I don't, I don't want I don't want him to know this, but it's true. I've been riding the Harley a lot more. <laughs> so well, I don't, he doesn't insult me or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's a good thing that besides voting with your keys is like pay attention instead of thinking like what this bike does. We kind of talked about with the, with the van. Like, don't worry about what it does or what it's supposed to do or whatever. Like, there's another measure that people don't, which is how does it make you feel? Yeah, like that's what you should actually be paying attention to because like oh Harleys are slow. This well. Well, you're not racing on the street anyway. Just go right. with the one that makes you feel good. Right. You know, and no, that's, it, that's it, like it, the easiest it, it's way. so tricky. I, I think how I feel right now is the Harley is, is a, is a classic hot rod car for me, you know, and that that's definitely what I want to take. If I'm going to Ventura, if I'm going to Hollywood, if I'm going somewhere, you know, that's a little, even the local bar. I'm posing. Yeah. 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 I got to pose. I got to put on my Harley. Th- that's what the Harley's for, and and then the the BMW. It's like for everything else. For fucking everything else. I mean, you're going to the beach. You're going to the yeah. grocery. Even I think you just picked. But yeah. now I now I have clarification on my on my answer from before. Yeah, because that was it was because you I started thinking about old man bikes because that's yeah. what we call old man. Like you have right. the bike that even if you don't ride, you're going to keep it for whatever. Right. 
And I was like, oh, like a 68 Bonneville. Like I love old Triumphs. Like yeah. in, the, in the, I think I just kind of answered it for myself when I was talking about how does it make you feel? Like that's my favorite bike to just hop on. That and makes like you feel around. the best. Like I feel cool as fuck on an old Triumph. I love those things. And anybody would just look at you like, oh, look at the old guy on the old bike. But right. to me, that is like, that's what, the, that bike is what made me want to ride motorcycles. I was outside some club and somebody like just fired it up. And well, it like, kind of, oh. it kind of brings you back to the first bike that you had but with more money. Yeah. <laughs> I almost, yeah, man, I love it. But they, they also like, it's cool. They have a little like narrow tank. They're not all like super yeah. fat and stuff. And again, big wide handlebars and you know. Yeah, the ca cafe For how long do you have cool your, um, your CB450? Oh man, I, I swore off all vent. I had like at over my life, I had like, like 50, no, not that many. I don't know, like eight vintage Hondas. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. No more vintage Hondas. And if I get another vintage bike, I'll get an old Triumph or an old Norton. But uh, yeah. My, my, uh, my first bike, actually, now that I recall it, my first street bike, I got in San Francisco from a good friend of mine. Her name was Maloa. And she had a 1981 Honda Shadow. Yeah. And it was, you know, she lived by the ocean. That thing was completely rusted. <laughs> Just gone to shit yeah and uh I, I you know she's like you can have it you know i gave her like 100 bucks 200 bucks right. like that i was like cool picked it up and then i just started cleaning that fucking thing up and then it started and then i was like all right cool yeah it's and on then from there that's how i got into the street bikes actually i we, just remember that when you said yeah, it we have that when we at the end of the day when i try to get them to kind of cool down and i go when you started riding motorcycles you didn't care about compression ratios and tire compounds and rebound dampening clicks like or lap times like you just hopped on some piece of shit and you rode down the street or you rode down the trail and it was magic right. and that's tap back into that like do that for your last session of every track day like literally check out the mountains and the trees and back it off 10 percent and just cruise around and you know feel what it feels like to just be on your own little personal rocket ship you know, because I know that I ruined my own riding by only trying to go fast or only trying to get better. And then, you know, I kind of lost sight of that. And so now maybe it's just getting more mature and just not worrying about it, you know, like just getting out there and riding around and feeling what it feels like to be on a motorbike because it's still about that. It's still, that's it. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's, a, it's a valid point because I think when people are riding, they're always thinking about what the people behind them are thinking, the people in front of them. And once they get to the stop sign, are people looking at me? Do I look as cool as I'm supposed to look? <laughs> I'm going to turn, take this turn. Do I look like this on the yeah, turn? Yeah. Realistically, when they're, you know, yeah, yeah. Just, just enjoy the ride. Especially if I'm around you taking pictures. Just yeah. enjoy the ride. That's, yeah. a, that's a whole different technique. Yeah, we talk about winning Instagram and then winning races, and they're two separate things. You yeah, know? two separate races. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I always, we were with a big crew of like 15, 20 people. Yeah. And and there's guys that are like, oh, no, no, we got to go canyons and go fast. And I was like, well, we nobody's going to know. Yeah. Because in the picture, you were stopped. Yeah. <laughs> so who cares? <laughs> you know, yeah. if you're thinking that, that as, l as long as you're leaning, it looks like you're going fast. It doesn't yeah. really matter. We start, we start every day with, uh, have you heard about the person who won SoCal Supermoto? Uh, uh, no. Like, like, right. You, you can't win SoCal Supermoto. Like, nobody cares. Like, right. I, I go, I'm going to tell <laughs> you something you're not going to hear at any other school, but yeah. it's true, and that's nobody gives a fuck how fast you are. Like, right. nobody cares. Like, it's all in your, no, in your head. Yeah. Like, so... But we do care. Everybody will care if, you, if you're riding safe. Everybody will care if you have a good attitude. Everybody will care if you're a nice person. Nobody really cares. Like, you know, it's like the, all this, like, internal, like, thing that you were talking about, like, what people think or whatever. So, you know, ride better. Learn the, learn the techniques. It makes riding a lot more fun. makes it safe and just have a good time. Absolutely. Where, where can we find you on social media, YouTube? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm on all the YouTubes. Under, uh, under what? Uh, SoCal Supermoto, uh, YouTube, Instagram, SoCal Supermoto. Uh, web socalsupermoto dot com. Starting, to, starting to see a theme All here. Booking Perfect. through the yeah. website. Facebook socalsupermoto. What? Get the yeah. fuck out of here. Um, yeah. Genius. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So right. for bookings, how how far in advance are you booking now? Um, I think we're sold out for the next couple of weeks, but there might be like a weekday spot here and there. Um, but uh, in general, they tend to sell. Out. Usually, we have a bit of flexibility, so I can add dates if they tend to sell out. But there's just a um, a calendar. And it's just, uh, you know, at SoCalSupermoto.com, you can click on the calendar. It'll say how many days are open for each day um, or how many spots are open for each day. So you can calculate it that way and, and go to town. Okay, sounds cool. good, man. Awesome, Ryan. Thank you for your time. And uh, we'll be following up and see you very soon. Yeah, thanks for coming out. And yeah. you, let me know when you want to come ride. Absolutely, we will. Good, man. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, thanks to you guys. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ride Boundless podcast. Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe. 
More importantly, share, 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 share. If you know anybody that's in the motorcycle or car industry or is a fanatic or whatever the case is, let them know about this podcast. Sharing is caring. Um, If you've already subscribed, thank you. If you haven't, make sure to do it. Until next week, ride safe, ride hard, ride boundless.